Calumet Citation came to the Belmont with a chance to be the fourth Triple Crown winner of the 1940s. He stumbled at the break, but still led wire to wire to win by six links, making jockey Eddie Arcaro the only jockey to win a pair of Triple Crowns. He had been aboard Calumet's Whirl Away in 1941. Our aerial coverage today, courtesy of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and its fleet of airships, reminding you to travel with peace of mind on Goodyear's new Assurance Tires. Well, winning, uh, there is a look at Smarty Jones, his ears pinned back. John Service takes a look at him. This happened just moments ago in barn five, the same barn as Kenny Rice noted earlier, Secretariat had been stabled in. Another look from Service. Smarty Jones uh, is getting that game face on that we talked about earlier. Well, winning the Triple Crown has become one of the most difficult feats in all of sports. Five taxing weeks at three different distances over three dissimilar tracks. For over 100 years, only 11 horses have achieved it, and it's been 26 years since a firm did it. But there have been close calls. Since 1978, nine other horses have come to the Belmont Stakes with a shot at the Triple Crown. One of the immortals are just a footnote. It's a fine line, as Tom Durkin explores. In sport, we like to throw around the term great a lot. But how great is great? It can be hard to quantify. For example, Secretariat was great. But can you measure greatness? 279 feet! That is 31 lengths. The standard of thoroughbred greatness, Secretariat's Belmont. It was the 70s, the me generation, a country conflicted, but a country that would unite behind a charismatic chestnut. He would bridge a 25-year generation gap that spanned back to Citation's Triple Crown of 1948. The Belmont measures greatness and strength ability and determination. Sometimes it just comes down to fate. Five close calls in the last seven years. Some very good horses have been on the precipice of triple crown greatness. But what stopped them in the Belmont? A good ride can stop you in the Belmont. Like Chris McCarran's. He sent touch gold to the lead, then he took him back to fourth and then blindsided Silver Charm in the shadow of the wire. Silver Charm has lost the lead, and Touch Gold will deny him the crown. A questionable ride can beat you in the Belmont, like Kent DeSormo's on Real Quiet, when he moved a furlong too soon, only to lose by an inch at the wire. It's going to be very close. It's too close to call. Charismatic, not going to get it done. It's a the grind of the Triple Crown Trail itself can stop you as it did the Charismatic, taking its toll on a foreleg in the last few yards of the Triple Crown Trail of 1999. Not getting to the front can stop a committed front runner, like it did to War Emblem. And War Emblem did not break alertly. War Emblem was off near the back of the pack. Going to the front may have stopped Funny Side, who worked too fast just four days before the race. And a change in tactic here for Funny Side today. He is going to be the early leader. And ran too fast, too soon in the race. Funny Side has dropped back to third. Here's the wire, and Empire Maker has won the 135th Belmont Stakes. Now, I know Smarty Jones is a very good horse. Today, I hope to call the race of a great horse. And speaking of greatness, there's the Smarty sign with Chappie Chapman holding the end and Pat uh, with the kids. And look at this. Here's a link to Secretariat. Penny Chenery, who owned the great Secretariat, as Tom said, that 31 length winner of the Belmont Stakes to complete the Triple Crown, here today to wish the Chapmans luck. This was the scene as he came home like a tremendous machine, in the words of the late Chick Anderson. Penny Chenery celebrating Secretariat's win then, and now wishing the Chapmans good luck with Smarty Jones today.
Well, one of the horses that uh, has been defeated by Smarty Jones, he's beaten five of his eight rivals already before coming to today's race, is Purge. Purge is going to try him again. Purge had been behind him in Arkansas, but between the Preakness and today's Belmont Stakes, Purge won the Peter Pan Stakes over this track. Trainer Todd Pletcher originally said he wasn't going to run against Smarty again, but he changed his mind. We wondered why. Mike Battaglia, do you have the answer? You're right, Tom, because I talked to Todd a couple days ago, and he said, you know, I wasn't going to run against him. You can't blame him, really. This horse, Purge, had won three out of five races. His only two losses came against Smarty Jones, but Todd said he started receiving letters and emails. He got this one email from a guy he doesn't even know, and it really showed some interesting comparisons between Purge and his grandsire, A.P. Indy. Neither of these two horses raced in the Derby or the Preakness. They both won the Peter Pan, and their buyer numbers leading into the Belmont were almost identical. So Todd talked it over with the owners. They decided, you know, we could wait a couple weeks running the Dwyer, but why not take a shot and go for the big one? So they're here in the Belmont today. Well, Mike, you did win the Peter Pan over this Belmont track. How important is that for today's race? You know, I, Todd, I, talk, I asked him about that. He said that he thinks that will really help his horse. But, you know, the combined field in the Belmont, they've had 62 starts between them, only three races here at Belmont Park. That's very unusual. He also said that the fact that Smarty Jones has not raced here will not hurt him at all. He doesn't need to take his racetrack with him. I also asked Todd, Todd, if you don't win it, who do you want to win? He, like almost everybody else, said, love to see Smarty Jones. And there is Smarty Bill Foster there pacing. The uh, butterfly is starting to fly over in barn five. And if Smarty Jones can do it, he would be the 12th winner of the Visa Triple Crown. What a less than two weeks beginning Thursday, June 17th. We'll be just down the road a bit at famed Shinnecock for golf's greatest championship, the U.S. Open. Don't miss Tiger Woods as he faces that challenging course and the world's best, including Vijay Singh and Masters champion Phil Mickelson. Golf's greatest championship, the U.S. Open, beginning Thursday, June 17th, right here on NBC. Record crowd for the Belmont Stakes. We'll be back. Prior to Smarty Jones, only two horses were undefeated coming to the Belmont. Majestic Prince and Seattle Slough in 1977, who won by four on a muddy track, the only undefeated Triple Crown winner. He would lose his next start, the Swap Stakes at Hollywood Park. Slough lived until 2002, dying 25 years to the day after winning the Kentucky Derby. And can Smarty Jones be like Seattle Slough and win the Triple Crown while undefeated? The fans certainly think so, as you see the odds on the bottom of your screen. That's a look at Smarty Jones, and soon the call will be to come over for the running of the Belmont. You know, there are a lot of other parallels between Smarty Jones and Seattle Slough. Look at this. They were both uh, undefeated coming to the Belmont. They both had eight wins in their eight starts. In fact, Smarty Jones' total margin and average margin, winning victory, uh, winning margin, I should say, is greater than that of Seattle Slough. And the money he's going to earn, if he makes it, is going to be greater than Seattle Slough as well. Well, like Slough's trainer Billy Turner in 1977, John Service was unknown on the Triple Crown Trail until Smarty Jones came along. A low profile is no accident for Service, who's always placed family ahead of fame. Dear Smarty Jones, I love you because you are the best. You are a beautiful horse. You are our champion. And the letters we get from the kids are great. I mean, we get some really good ones from the kids. I love Smarty Jones, and I want to be just like him. Smarty says never give up. Smarty is the best horse. In a child's mind, the story of Smarty Jones has become a real-life fairy tale. An underdog horse from humble beginnings trained by a man more interested in family than fame, who is really just a defensive coordinator for the Bucks County Bears. John Service has found a balance between family life and the grind of the track. My family's most important. My kids are my life. I'd love to be known as a great trainer, but I'd rather be a great dad first, you know? That's the most important thing to me. And I spend as much time as I can with my kids. You know, it goes by too fast. You don't want to miss out on that. My dad was a jockey, and he was on the road a lot. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, growing up, we didn't get to see a whole lot of him. He didn't want any of us to get into this business. 
And I think the reason being because how much it took him away from home. It was obviously lonely being away from home, but it was a very rewarding job for the kids. I have three brothers and sisters. Out of the four of us, three of us were in horse racing. So he didn't do a very good job of keeping us out. He's probably a good trainer. You gotta try hard, you gotta respect the horse. You can't treat it like it's just some animal. John was one of those rare individuals that could do it all. Uh, he had great natural horse sense, and John was the total package. Learned his business, had a good background, and his time with Mark Reed was really what polished him off. And it was Mark Reed who introduced him to Roy Chapman, who was looking for a trainer to take his young colt to hallowed ground. Service knew he had something, something similar to those stories his father used to tell him, stories about the great ones. He says, Dad, I got a colt that's doing them funny things he always talked about. He's like a son to the, to the point where he wants to make me happy. And when I bear down on him, I say, all right, you know, you got to give me a little bit more here. And he seems to do that plus. And I just wonder, man, how good is this horse? He's pretty fast for a horse. Faster than two race cars running. And he made it to the Kentucky Derby and he won. On the Preakness, he beat the, all the horses from a, from a long distance. And he's trying to win the Belmont to win the Triple Crown. It's beyond winning a race now. It's greatness. It's immortality. If I never win another race as a trainer, I could go to go in a racetrack and people go, oh, that's a guy that trained Smarty Jones, was undefeated and won the Triple Crown. He's America's horse. He's the U.S. Olympic team. The whole country is just rallying behind him and, uh, and they're hoping he can pull it off. I love Smarty Jones. I love Smarty Jones. Go Smarty! Go Smarty! He's gonna win the Triple Crown. You are the best we know. Good luck, Smarty Jones. <laughs> and there's a live shot at the barn as they were all watching the piece about John Service and Smarty Jones. There's John himself. You know, I asked him the other day, the, the offers to train some of the best horses in America, the best bred horses, uh, will be coming his way after this run with Smarty Jones. And I, I asked him if he would leave Philadelphia Park to take some of those offers, but he said for the next year he would do nothing until his oldest son, Blaine, graduates from high school, and then the family will sit down and make that decision as a family. Typical answer from John service. In fact, he said, you know, maybe Blaine will go to the University of Kentucky. Of course, another famous member now of the uh, Smarty team is Stuart Elliott, who has been flawless in his rides in the Derby in Preakness, and he's with Bob Costas. All right, Tom, that's right. Here is the 39-year-old who, after 20 years as a rider, finds himself as an overnight sensation. Stuart, if Smarty Jones runs his race today, is there any way he can lose? I think he's going to be awful tough. I mean, off of his last race, the Preakness was very impressive. Um, he won very easily. And I think if he runs like that today, he's going to be super tough. The Belmont is thought to be more of a jockey's race than the other two legs of the Triple Crown. Uh, a lot of tactical errors have been made historically in this race, often by some very good jockeys, with the entire field trying to bait you into a premature move. How will you know when it's time to go? Well, I, you know, I know my horse pretty well. Um, I'm just going to let him get comfortable and, you know, we have a long way to go and just try to reserve him, get him to relax and uh, just take things as we go through the race. You're not a regular rider here at Belmont Park. In fact, they had to assign a locker to you. You had a mount in the third race today, but just the 16th time you've ridden a horse here at Belmont. Is that a factor at all? Well, I don't think so, really. Um, you know, I, I think I know the track well enough. I, I have a good horse and um, as long as he performs I think everything will be fine you look around this jockey's room and then in Baltimore and before that in Louisville and you see people like Jerry Bailey or Gary Stevens or Pat Day great jockeys who have not done what you're now on the brink of doing how does that make you feel very privileged um, it's just unbelievable and I just you know sometimes I can't believe it it's just a great thing you don't seem nervous you're very composed well, thank you. <laughs> Does that mean you're churning inside? Well, no. Um, you know, I'm. 
I feel pretty good. Um, you know, I know I have a, a great chance, and uh, just do the best I can. Last thing, your uh, fiance Lauren Vanazzi had been feeling ill, but uh, she's rallied and she's able to be here. Right, she's um, she's doing much better. She's been resting, and uh, she's excited and, and seems to be doing well. All right, good luck today, Stuart. Thank you very much. Stuart Elliott, back to Tom Hammond. All right, Bob, and the Stuart, of course, an inspirational story as the horses start their way over. Stuart Elliott uh, battling alcoholism, went to rehab. He's been sober now for some time. The scrapes with the law behind him, that was all a result of his drinking. So an inspirational story with the way he has put his life in order, as have the Chapmans, who are recovering alcoholics. They've been sober now for over 20 years. As we said, it is a great story. All the people around Smarty Jones. So as you see, the horses have begun their trek over to the paddock to be saddled for the Belmont Stakes. Will Stuart Elliott and Smarty Jones take the Triple Crown? At Belmont Park, Stuart Elliott in the colors of the Chapman Sunday Farm weighing out. All the horses carry 126 pounds for the Belmont Stakes, and the horses have left their stables on the backstretch and making their way over to the paddock here at Belmont Park. Let's go down to Bob Newmeyer with Smarty Jones. Tom, with the man of the hour, maybe the horse of the century, John Service. And John, with all the hullabaloo of this campaign, have you had a quiet moment at all? What have you been thinking about during those times? Uh, not really. I have. Um, might be the horse of the century. Who knows? There's uh, millions of people that are betting on your horse today, and hundreds of thousands with those $2 souvenir tickets. Are you feeling the burden on your shoulders for them at all? Well, you know, it, it's, I mean, everybody's rallying behind him, and we'd sure like to get it done for him, but, you know, again, I, you know, our main goal is the Kentucky Derby, and we got that done, and if we're Triple Crown winner, then that's great. Nine times trainers have made this solitary walk, and have won the Derby, have won the Preakness, have had the first two in their hip pocket, only to lose the third. How confident of you that today is going to be different? I feel good. My horse is going to the race real good. I feel good. Tell us about his training coming up to this race. Um, he's done everything right. I mean, you know, I haven't been able to, to find a kink in him yet, so uh, I have no reason to believe he won't run his race. I did notice that there are a lot of game faces on in your camp today. I realize the enormity of the moment. Can you put it in your own words what this means to you? This is the biggest step. It gets no bigger than this. And... Uh, you know, I, I told all the guys today, if we could pull this off, then we're going to walk into history together. And that's as good as it gets. We wish you the best. Thank you very much. John Service, Smarty Jones. Tom, back to you. All right, and perhaps that walk into history has begun with this walk to the paddock. Look at Smarty Jones. Do you think he knows? Back to the Belmont right after this. Welcome back to Belmont Park and the 136 running of the Belmont Stakes. There's Smarty Jones arriving in the paddock. That's a live shot. And the fans a moment ago seeing him arrive in the paddock on the television sets here at Belmont let out a huge cheer. All eyes on Smarty Jones. Well, you know, last year Funnyside had a chance to win the Triple Crown, but Empire Maker ruined that with a victory over him here in the Belmont Stakes, trained by Bobby Frankel. Frankel has a horse in this year's Belmont as well in Master David, and he's with Donna Brothers. Well, as you can see, Bobby Frankel is with Donna Brothers, but he's also saddling his horse right now. And you're right, last year, Empire Maker unseated Funnyside's bid for the Triple Crown. You know, Bobby Frankel wins races at an incredibly high rate, like 30, 33% year in and year out. Master David was 12th in the Kentucky Derby. He was a bad third behind Purge in the Peter Pan Stakes. And, you know, Bobby doesn't enter into races just to fill him. So if he's here, he has to think that he has a shot to win it. And as we mentioned last year with Empire Makers win in the Belmont Stakes, Bobby Frankel's a New Yorker, and Empire Maker was booed when he came back to the winner's circle after winning the Belmont Stakes. You just don't see that, not even here in New York. So I'm sure that even Bobby was surprised by that. And as soon as he gets this girth on him, we'll ask him how he felt about that moment right after winning one of the biggest races of his life and uh, and then being booed. Bobby, we were just talking about Empire Maker. You're from New York. You win the Belmont Stakes finally, and you come back to a crowd and you get booed. How did, did you expect that? Well, to be honest with you, I, I didn't hear him. Okay. Jer Jerry hearing him, but I was so into winning the race and everything. And I just ducked, and I, I got a bear can thrown at me, but uh, 
Besides that, I didn't have a bear. Did you manage to dock the bear can? Yeah, we got we we beat the bear can. Good job. Now we were talking about what a high rate you win race is at. This horse doesn't look like he's sitting on a winning race, but you wouldn't be here if you didn't think he could run well. Why are you here? Well, I'm here. He's training really well. I, if, if I had any excuse not to run him, I wouldn't have run him. But I, I don't know if he's good enough. But he's uh, at the top of his game right now, so we'll take a shot. And if Smarty Jones doesn't run his race, you might just be right there. Well, everybody, a few people like Eddie Tin, he beat him in those, so. You know. All right, good luck to you, Bobby. Yeah. I think the great Alan Jerkins helped convince Bobby Frankel to run. And there's Pat Chapman, one of the owners of Smarty Jones, hugging trainer John Service with Smarty walking behind them. That was a few moments ago. One of the horses, of course, hoping to upset Smarty Jones today is Purge, trained by Todd Pletcher. He's with Kenny Rice. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, a minute ago, Cayman uh, reared up just a bit in stall number three and had to back out, so all the trainers uh, just taking a look over at the situation, including Nick Zito, who I was just with, with Birdstone right beside him. Pletcher was looking at Purge. Anyway, uh, Zito has told me that he feels that uh, both of his horses, Birdstone and Royal Assault, are coming in here, probably running for second place. He said he would love to get that, but he reminded me that 36 Red had a poor derby showing, skipped the Preakness, and finished second in the Belmont. He's hoping it works that way for Birdstone. And then, of course, Royal Assault is going the same way that Sarava did uh, two years ago when he stopped War Emblem's bid. He said, you know, all we can hope for is maybe history repeats a little bit. Zito has been runner-up five times in this race. Now let's go over and check with Mike Battaglia. Mike? Thanks, Kenny. And I was right next to Cayman when this happened. And uh, Angel Medina's horse, he reared up. He kicked the assistant trainer's son, and he kicked him right in the head. Uh, he appeared to be hurt for a minute. He was very, very groggy. He's still conscious. He's up and he's standing, and he seems a lot better now, but it was a very scary incident here in the paddock. And there's a look at Cayman, the horse that acted up just a few moments ago. It's been 26 years since a firm captured the last Triple Crown, but the Belmont Stakes that day was exciting enough for the memory to last that long. Affirmed in 1978, the subject of our Buick Belmont Stakes moment. Affirmed captured the public's imagination with his gritty find-a-way-to-win determination and from his rivalry with Alidar. The Calumet Colt was favored in the Derby, but Affirmed won by a length and a half. Then in the Preakness, the Wolfson's Harborview colors went wire to wire. So trainer Laz Barrera sent his Colt to the Belmont with a triple in his sights. The kid, Steve Cawthon, who had just turned 18, had the chance to be the youngest Triple Crown winning jockey. Affirmed on the inside, and Alidar hooked up early. And through the home stretch, it was one of the great duels in racing history. Feeling the whip left-handed from Cawthon for the first time, Affirmed again found a way to beat his rival and claim the Triple Crown. Just a few moments ago, the jockeys got the call to report to the paddock. You know, this is a jockey's race, a mile and a half. They don't ride many races that distance, just like the horses don't run that far very often. And the jockeys can play a huge part. There's Stuart Elliott, Smarty Jones jockey, in the blue colors. And there's the scene in the paddock here at Belmont Park. Let's go to our handicappers now, Mike and Bob, to see how they analyze this race. Well, quite simply, is Smarty Jones the cinch that everybody believes? But you know, there's no such thing as a cinch in thoroughbred racing, but I believe that this is a great horse, and I think he's as close to a cinch as you can possibly get. Was so impressed with his race in the Preakness. One of the greatest Triple Crown races that I have ever seen. When they turned for home, it looked like it was going to be a race. Look, here's Rock Hard 10 in the black behind Smarty Jones. Right here, it looked like, boy, this is going to be a horse race. Well, five strides later, it looked like, wow, this is going to be a rout. Look at Smarty Jones. And Rock Hard 10 had made a huge move. He had passed horses like they were standing still on the turn. I really thought this was going to be a race. Look at Smarty Jones. He wins with something in reserve. Since then, this horse has been trained as well or better as he was coming into the Preakness. And if anything, I think this horse could show improvement today. But, Mike, I've been around the track long enough in this yeah. campaign long enough to know of the extreme difficulty in running three quality championship races in five short weeks. 
So let's go shopping, folks. And I've got three reasons why Rock Card 10 could spring the upset. I mentioned at the top of the show the expenditure of energy in the gate before the Preakness. Here's reason two. How wide is this run that Gary Stevens looped the field in his attempt to chase down Smarty in the Preakness? I mean, he's five or six pads out from the rail. But look at him inhaling these horses and showing that kind of ability that makes Rock Card 10 a special horse. I thought he was a short horse that day. He's only had a handful of races and no he was not able to run down smarty jones but if he does today the ormans trainer jason dad mike are from calgary they could celebrate mike a belmont stakes and a beloved stanley cup championship of their beloved calgary flames you know i agree with you about rock hard 10 i think that's what made smarty jones look even better because rock hard 10 was making that big run he's a heck of a horse and smarty jones had no trouble can he improve 11 lengths he, Smarty Jones will have to really regress, I think, for Rock Hard 10 or anything in this field to beat him. If anything beats Smarty Jones, it will be the Triple Crown itself, the three races in the five weeks. I don't think these horses are in the same category. All right, guys, and uh, I took a straw poll of the rest of our crew. All the rest of us are picking Smarty. Only Bob is the contrarian today. And if you'd like to let your feelings be known, you can log on to NBCSports.com. 67% of you think that Smarty Jones will win the Triple Crown with a victory today in the Belmont Stakes. And let's update you on the current odds. And Purge at 14 to 1, 7 to 1, Rock Hard 10. And Smarty Jones continues to be the 1 to 5 favorite. Riders right, up, number one, let's go. Paddock Judge Neil Catrone saying bring them out and riders up. And the horses for the 136 Belmont Stakes will make their way to the tunnel under the stands and then onto the racetrack. There's Smarty Jones, one to five. Wow, He's on track to be the most bet on thoroughbred ever in American racing history. More money will be bet on him today to win the Belmont Stakes than has ever been bet on a single horse in American racing history. John Service and Stuart Elliott. There's Joe Service, John's dad. And a leg up. Charles, I presume that Sacred Heart medal has gone under the saddle for the third time in this series. All horsemen are superstitious. I'm sure John Service has it there. Smarty Jones is looking positively beatific walking around the <laughs> ring. Maybe that's because he had a personal house call from four nuns from the Little Sisters of the Poor Charity just a few days ago who came to give their personal extended blessings to Smarty Jones. John's aunt, John Service's aunt, Sister Catherine Marie in a convent just in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and they've been betting steadily on Smarty in this Triple Crown Series. After the Preakness, they made... A display on the windowsill of model horses showing where they all were at the finish and they said there's smarty he was way ahead of all the rest of them it'd be great if you could arrange the race just like that <laughs> the way you wanted to but i must say smarty is certainly doing his part here he is not reacting at all to this crowd he'll get a test when he comes through the tunnel because the roar will be enormous but there he is he's an uncomplicated fellow they hang a bridle on him he doesn't wear a tongue tie he just Puts the rattle on and comes over here and runs his race. He's tough and he's consistent, and he's certainly the one that everyone's eyes are on right now. Who do you think's more nervous, Stewart or Smarty? Well, you know, John uh, Service said an interesting thing. He said it was up to him to remain very calm, he said, because everyone around him and around the horse would pick up on it if he were nervous. And he certainly seemed calm coming over. Stuart Elliott has been pretty unflappable. He said, I've been very happy to be a big fish in a little pond all my life, but suddenly he finds himself in a very big ocean today. <laughs> and, uh, of course, making quite an entrance as the last horse in line, number nine, Making a circle of the paddock. People jammed all around that paddock to get an eye on him. And on the front side of the stands, everyone standing. And, you know, Donna Brothers is riding Butterscotch, who is Smarty's pony. He's the most famous lead pony in the world. You know, he's a full-size horse, but at the racetrack they call him ponies, even though he's full-size horse. And uh, he's, in fact, a quarter horse. He used to be a barrel racer. Scotch, with a twist, is his real name. 
But Butterscotch, he's become the most famous lead pony in all of racing, and he will be Donna Brothers' mount today for this Belmont Stakes. And getting ready for the call to the post. Smarty Jones, no telling how many $2 souvenir tickets have been sold on him today. One man ordered 6,000 of them. They have special windows set up here at Belmont Park just for that. Smarty, the last one in line, going into the tunnel that will lead them out to the front of the stands. And everyone on their feet here in the record crowd at Belmont as the first horses make their appearance. It should be quite a roar as Smarty makes his emergence from that tunnel into the view of all those people in the front of the stands. There's Birdstone, Rock Hard 10. Royal Assault after that. Meanwhile, through the tunnel. Smarty Jones with the uh, flash bulbs going off. Everyone wants a shot of Smarty Jones. It could be a historical photo if Smarty runs his race today. He's about halfway through that tunnel now. When he makes his appearance, let's listen for the crowd reaction. for the Belmont Stakes. Number one, Master David, trained by Bobby Frankel, who trained Empire Maker to upset Funnyside last year. Funnyside's triple ruined by Master David, who was third in the Peter Pan, 12th behind Smarty in the Kentucky Derby. Number two is Purge, who won the Peter Pan Stakes by six and three-quarter lengths, but it chased Smarty Jones in both the Rebel Stakes and Arkansas Derby. In fact, uh, in the Arkansas Derby, he was fifth, beaten seven and a half lengths. Number three is Cayman, the long shot, who began his racing career last year in Mexico, has never won a stakes race. Cayman is a sort of crocodile. He'd take a big bite if he wins today under Ramon Dominguez, who led the U.S. in total wins last year. Number four, Birdstone, in the colors of the Mary Lou Whitney stables. Mary Lou and Nick Zito won a race on the card already today. In fact, Zito has two winners already today. In the Derby, Birdstone lost one of his shoes, finished eighth, but he did win the Champagne Stakes as a two-year-old on this Belmont track last year. Number five is Rock Hard 10, the beautiful 17-hand horse. After six weeks off, he was second to Smarty Jones in the Preakness, but was beaten over 11 links. This is only his fifth lifetime start. Number six, Royal Assault, Tracy Farmer and Nick Zito's second horse. Won the Sir Barton Stakes Preakness Day at Pimlico. As you hear a crowd as Smarty Jones goes by another portion of the stands here. Royal Assault had been fifth in the Wood Memorial. Tap Dancer, based in Philadelphia Park, is here. He was in the Sir Barton, also fourth behind Royal Assault. Number eight is Eddington. Eddington third in the Wood Memorial, then excluded because of lack of graded stakes earnings in the Derby. Came back in the Preakness off a five-week layoff and finished third. Jerry Bailey could uh, send him up closer to the pace today. And there's Smarty Jones, Pennsylvania bred, but conceived in Kentucky. And all the Kentucky breeders trying to get him to stand at stud at their farm now. Last week, an offer of $30 million for him, $40 million if he wins the Belmont. We understand just a day ago, the offer now has gone to $50 million if he wins the Belmont Stakes today. Marty Jones, sift different tracks, his ninth different distance, he is eight for eight. And now, to introduce the official song of the Belmont Stakes, here's Tom Durkin. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Belmont Park welcomes a widely acclaimed member of the renowned Irish tenors, Ronan Tynan, performing New York, New York. Start spreading the news I'm leaving today I want to be a part of it New York, New York I want to wake up In a city that never sleeps And find I'm a number one Top of the list Costas back at Belmont over my right shoulder, the starting gate. In just a few moments, Smarty Jones will break from gate number nine. He will go off as one of the biggest favorites in the history of the Belmont Stakes. The last time a less than even money favorite won this race, 1978. Affirm, the last Triple Crown winner. He went off at three to five. Will history repeat itself today? We're about to find out. Again, Tom Hamm. All right, Bob, and the horses are coming up to that starting gate on this largest of American racing ovals, a mile and a half in circumference, and the starting gate set just before the finish line, one lap around, and there's Smarty Jones. Donna Brothers on Butterscotch, out on the track. Everybody behaving, Donna? Everybody is behaving. Tom, you have a vantage point from up front, but I've got a view from below, and believe me, there is standing room only in those stands, and everybody is holding up Smarty Jones signs and rooting for Smarty Jones. It's an enormous crowd and an enormous day, so we've got a lot to look forward to, but all the horses have been well behaved. Smarty Jones acts like he's done this a thousand times already, just like he's handled the other Triple Crown races. Now, now what about Rock Hard Rock 10? Rock Hard 10 now goes up to the starting gate, as we talked about before, he's gonna be the first to load, and he's already doing some of the stuff we saw in the Preakness. He's already hesitating, but they've said ahead of time that they're just gonna give him his time and let him figure out on his own time when it's time for him to go I'll in. Go and take him in hand if you want. We're just going to have to watch and hope that he decides to do it here very soon. Um, right now they're taking the path of least resistance, just leading him around, trying to get him to follow him. And I think uh, they've got the front of the starting gates open. I think they're just going to have to hope that he decides to walk up here. I watched him school in the starting gate in the morning, but this crowd is definitely going to distract him to a certain extent. A lot of people screaming, a lot of action going on behind him, in front yeah. of him, and all around him. Donna, that's uh, Hector Solar, who's been working with him ever since he's uh, been here at Belmont, since the Preakness, his own private assistant starter, as it were, and he's being very patient with him. Now, they did school him with a blindfold earlier, and Bob Duncan, the starter, said, if need be, as a last resort, they will put a blindfold on him to load him into the gate. Now Hector trying to get him in there, but he just will not go in. And now nobody wants to get behind this huge animal, believe me. And you heard Corey Black say earlier that he has a mind of his own and he doesn't want anyone telling him what to do. And now Alex Solis will dismount and they'll see if they can get him in without a rider. They had schooled him, Tom, this week with this natural gate schooling technique, which really depends on establishing a relationship between the handler Hector Soleil and the horse and they respond to pressure back away but clearly with 120,000 people it's failing and there goes the blindfold. He had been schooled with this earlier in the week and hopefully he'll walk right in now. Meanwhile the other horses are forced to cool their heels as it were including Smarty Jones and you see uh, Lockhart 10 finally into the gate with the blindfold and now the other Horses will load in single loads here. 
as you look at Master David who goes into the inside post. Meanwhile Alex Solis in the rock hard 10 colors remounting his colt. John Service his wife Sherry watching as their colt seem to handle the delay very well. There's Cayman going in. Next will be Birdstone. Lauren Venoza was there with John Service watching them load in. That's Stuart Elliott's girlfriend. Here's Tap Dancer, then Eddington, and then Smarty Jones. There's Lauren Venoza, Stuart Elliott's fiance. And now for the call of the 136 Belmont Stakes, here's Tom Durkin. Smarty Jones takes his spot in post nine, moments away from the start. Will he take his place in racing history? We'll see. They're off in the 136 Belmont. Smarty Jones got off to a good beginning today. Eddington not off particularly well. Rock Hard 10 is showing speed this afternoon. He's right up there with Smarty Jones who's on the outside. Purge comes through on the rail and Eddington will be on the outside of Smarty Jones as they move into the clubhouse turn. And then it's Cayman now who's running fifth and angles over toward the inside. Birdstone in between horses sixth, Royal Assault to seventh, Master David is reined in to run back in eighth position and long shot tap dancer trails the field. Purge is the leader. Rock Hard 10 right up on the pace today. And Stuart Elliott trying to find a comfort zone there with Smarty Jones. They're in the clear on the outside third. Not far behind Jerry Bailey and Eddington running along in fourth. Then they're followed by Royal Assault and Birdstone on the outside. The opening quarter went in 24 and 1 5 seconds. The half 48 and 3 5 seconds. The pace is fairly soft. And Smarty Jones has taken the lead as they begin their long journey down the Belmont backstretch. But he's not going to get a breather. It is Eddington to press him all the way and rock hard 10 looms large just in behind the lead he's only two lengths behind smarty jones now there's a break of another two and a half lengths back and purge down toward the inside he's working harder to be fourth birdstones alongside him the field now moving for the five for long marker smarty jones a challenge on the inside from rock hard 10 there's five for longs to go just a minute from the wire and smarty jones has to hold on to that lead for just one minute more rock hard 10 is pressing him from the inside. Eddington is working harder to stay within two lengths of the lead. Birdstone commences a rally. He's six lengths from the front. Purge has nothing left. Then farther back it's Royal Assault. Master David and Tap Dancer around the far turn and it's Smarty Jones. He lets it out a notch to lead by a length and a half. Birdstone is coming up on the outside. Rock Hard 10 is toiling. He's now three lengths behind. They're coming to the top of the stretch. Smarty Jones is a four length lead. Birdstone is moving to be second on the outside. Rock Hard 10 is back to third. And Smarty Jones enters the stretch to the roar of 120,000. But Birdstone is going to make him earn it today. The whip is out on Smarty Jones. It's been 26 years. It's just one furlong away. Birdstone is an upside front. They're coming down to the finish. Can Smarty Jones hold on? Here comes Birdstone. Birdstone surges past. Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. Smarty Jones was valiant, but Vanquish finishing second. Royal Assault came on to be third. And so this Triple Crown remains vacated for 26 long years. And this magical Triple Crown trail of Smarty Jones comes to a disheartening end in the final strides of the Belmont Stakes. Hearts broken again in the final strides at the Belmont. They ganged up on him, everybody took a shot at him, and Birdstone finally got there in the closing strides. Remember Birdstone, one of the few horses that had raced over this Belmont Oval. He won the Champagne Sakes, the biggest race for two-year-olds here in New York last year. He had sort of fallen on hard times this spring in the Kentucky Derby. He lost his shoe, didn't run well, but he came back to the track where he'd had his greatest success and upset Smarty's bid for the Triple Crown, the first loss in Smarty Jones' career. It's the first Belmont victory for Nick Zito, the New Yorker, in 12 tries after finishing second five times. And Donna is with Stuart Elliott on Smarty Jones. Stuart, I have to say I'm sorry for you, but I think all the viewers at home are going to be a little worried about Smarty Jones. Is he okay? He's fine. He's fine. I mean, he, he ran. He ran. I don't know. That other horse just come. Come and got him. It looked like you were pressed throughout from both sides. 
yes a little bit on both sides but my horse was still just dragging me and turned for home and he, he went to run and that horse just come and got us if you could put your finger on anything that caused the defeat today could you say no no horse racing that's horse racing Stuart, i'm sorry about it but he'll he'll live to fight again thank you all right donna the mile and a half of the belmont stakes the test of a champion crestfall and Stuart elliott and they didn't let him have it easily they tested him every step of the way and it was birdstone who made a huge move you could see him coming on the back stretch into the turn for home and birdstone you know he loves this belmont track in the famous colors of the Whitney stable Mary Lou Whitney the owner her late husband C.V. Whitney one of the great scions of the American turf and Smarty Jones for the first time in his nine career races walks back without tasting victory and Donna is with winning jockey Edgar Prado on Birdstone. Edgar, this is reminiscent of 2002. Sarava unseated. War, Adm or, I'm sorry, War Emblem's bid for the Triple Crown. You're back. Yes, and I want to say thanks to God, thanks to my family, and thanks to all the connections. And I'm very sorry that for Jason, uh, Mr. Service, and all the connections for Smarty Jones. But I had to do my job, and that's what I'm paying. For, I get paid for. I'm sure you're happy to win the race, but it, I can sense a touch of remorse in your voice for the connections with Smarty Joe. Especially because I know Elio for a long time. He's a good friend, good rider, good person. And he deserves it. And, uh, but uh, this is part of the business, and I'm very sorry that it has to be me. Edgar, let's give Birdstone his due. This was a very, very precocious two-year-old, but he has not shown up much this year. So tell me, how did he finally get it to put together on Belmont Day? Well, Nick did a super job. He took it back to Saratoga where he is very happy over there. He trained it very slightly and uh, he bring the horse 100% right. Finally, we, ha we have a nice dry track, Belmont one for one. So everything, everything worked out beautiful. For At what point did you think you had the race won? Well, when I uh, passed the half mile pole, I haven't really hit my horse and he started picking him up, so I don't have a chance to even get second or win the race. And like yeah, I'm in the race. Congratulations. What are you going to tell Nick, Nick when you get back? He was 11 and 0 going into this race. He finally gets his, his first Belmont win. Well, don't change. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Congra Congratulations, Edgar. We go to Mike Battaglia. Thanks, Donna. With Nick Zito. Nick, this is the one you wanted. You've wanted this Belmont yeah. for a long time. Yeah, you got it today. How you feeling? I feel great. We got it for the right people. You know, the Whitney's and the farmers are great. And what could I say? And finished third with Roll the Salt, too. This was incredible. How do you feel about beating that? There's John Service. John. John Service just came in and congratulated Nick Zito. Nick, that was really a touch of class right there. Oh, he's a class guy. That really He's was. a class guy, and he brought the sport where it should be. And Smarty Jones will always be one of the most famous horses ever. He's got his own niche, and really? it was cool. But Mary Lou Whitney pulled through with her husband, John, and my great staff. Thank Pablo you, Nick. And everybody. Thanks, Nick. we got to go to Kenny. Thank he's you. with John. Thanks, Nick. Kenny. Thanks, Mike. Uh, John, you just went over and congratulated Nick Zito. What were your thoughts as they turned for home in that, and it looked like Smarty Jones was pulling away? Well, I was a little concerned. It just didn't look like, you know, the, the one thing I was really concerned about. It just didn't look like he settled as good as he had in his previous races, and, uh, you know, I was worried about that the whole three weeks, and, and it obviously came to, came to hand. With about a, 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 probably a mile to go in the race, he got the challenge from Rock Hard 10. Then he started to settle in and pull away. Were you feeling better at that time? To be very honest with you, I wasn't feeling good down the backside. He just didn't look like he was settling like he had, and, and I was really concerned about that. You kept the same routine coming into the day. Was this basically the same routine? Did he feel good this morning? Did you feel confident when you walked him over here? I felt very good. You know, the one thing I was worried about the whole time in between the Preakness was, you know, him just being too sharp, and uh, obviously I couldn't get him settled enough. I was up there in the box with you just after the race. You, you turned around. And Mr. Chapman said something to you. Could you tell us what uh, you two briefly talked about? Um, he asked me who won it, and to be honest with you, I don't know what we even went on after that. I was watching my horse. As far as this whole run for yourself, I remember talking in Arkansas with you just before the Arkansas Derby, just before you made this uh, fabulous run. When you look back, any emotions running through your mind in those final strides? Yeah, you know, I mean, it uh, it hurt, but hell, we had a we had a really good run and. Uh, and we're going to put our heads down. We're proud. 
And as far as uh, the family, I believe you said a couple of things to your sons that were around you and your wife as well, right after Birdstone uh, finished just uh, in front at the wire. What did you say to them? I told them that, uh, you know, we, we did a good job and, uh, you know, don't put your head down. Don't be upset. We did a good job. Don't forget that. And you seem like a man that uh, still felt very comfortable and, and after the race that, that, you know, you had your horse ready to come in here. Yeah, I, you know, my, my horse ran a race. I mean, he ran a very good race. He just, I think what really hurt us was the fact that he didn't settle. You know, he got a lot of pressure early. Um, he kind of drugged Stu to the lead where before he just settled off the pace really nice and I, you know, that when they turned down the backside, I was concerned. John, thanks for your time. Thank you, Kenny. He's been a very gracious winner and certainly gracious here in defeat, rushing over to shake hands with Nick Zito right after the race. Tom? All right, Kenny. John Service indeed has been uh, handling all this success with grace and class. And there's Edgar Prado. Can you be sad after winning the biggest race of your career? Seemed like it when Donna talked to him. Let's look at the prices. Birdstone went off at 36 to 1. Paid $74, $14.860. Smarty, $330 and $260. Royal Assault was third and paid $610. The Exacta, $139. And you saw the other prices. The White Carnations for the Belmont Stakes win on Birdstone. We'll have the full race replay when we return to Belmont Park. coverage of the Belmont Stakes, courtesy of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and its fleet of airships, reminding you to enjoy the drive on Goodyear's new Assurance Tires. Birdstone, the upset winner of the Belmont Stakes today, ending Smarty Jones' bid to win the Triple Crown. And now our Computer Associates race replay, and with Bob Newmeyer, trackside is Stuart Elliott to watch it with us, our Computer Associates race replay of the Belmont Stakes. Smarty Jones breaking on the outside, post position nine. And who better to talk about it than the man himself? Stuart, tell us about the break in the early part of the race. Well, my horse broke very good, and I, I just, you know, tried to get him over just a little bit and, and slow the pace down. I actually let a couple horses come up running on the inside of me because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get my horse to relax and slow down, which he did. Uh, we had a good trip. I, I had plenty of horse the whole way. When I asked him, he he went to running for me down the lane. We we just got run down. All right, you have uh, you have Rock Hard Ten between horses and Purge on the lead. And at this point, I guess you're committed to go three wide at this juncture. Yes, I I wasn't really concerned about saving a lot of ground. The outside seems to be good. Uh, that I was just main concern was having my horse relaxed, which which he was. All right, now Purge is going to back out, and now Rock Hard Ten and you start volleying, and now you've got Eddington with more pressure points coming up on the outside. Eddington, Eddington forced me a little bit here, but still, I mean, I'm still sitting very comfortably. Um, you know, I'm still in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, uh, my horse, <laughs> I thought he ran his race. He just, you know, unfortunately, he didn't win. All right, you've got a long way to go from here. Rock Hard Ten's trying to battle back on the inside. Solis makes his actual second move on the inside. Bailey is furiously pumping Eddington. He looks like he's finished. You're looking around over your right shoulder, probably still feeling pretty good about yourself. I'm still sitting with some horse. You know, I'm trying to just be patient and wait, and uh, which, you know, they forced me a little bit, but my horse was still very comfortable. All right, now you've put, I believe, Rock Hard 10 away at this point. Eddington's done. Purge is done. Rock Hard 10 is done. And you're sailing around. At this point, were you worrying about something from the back? Well, I, I thought I was pretty confident. Uh, you know, I had some horse still. I was still sitting, and uh, my horse responded. He, he never stopped running. You think you were a winner at this point? I thought I was pretty confident. I said, the horse is going to have to really come running to beat me. Now you're looking around. You're looking over your shoulder, and here is the ominous specter of Edgar Prado and Birdstone, who won the Champagne here last year as a two-year-old. And now he's going to engage you in mid-stretch. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, I've seen him coming pretty strong, and my horse was trying. We just couldn't hold him off. The early jousting with the other horses on both sides of you, Purge, Rock Hard 10, Eddington, ultimately perhaps cost you this race? I would say more so just the mile and a half. A mile and a half, and is the winner, Birdstone. Stewart, congratulations on one great ride in this Triple Crown. Thank you. A gracious Stuart Elliott.
Tom, back to you. All right, Bob, and thanks to Stewart for sticking around despite his disappointment to go over the race with us in that Computer Associates race replay. Edgar Prado, the winning jockey on Birdstone, pulled the biggest upset in Belmont Stakes history when he rode Sarava to victory, ending War Emblem's chance at the Triple Crown. There's a look at the complete order of finish. Rock Hard 10 fading to fifth. Tap dancer Master David Kamen and Purge. Birdstone, the winner. Belmont Park, where Birdstone has upset Smarty Jones today, ending Smarty's bid to become the 12th winner of the Visa Triple Crown. And for the presentation, let's go to Bob Costas. All right, Tom, thank you. With us, Tim Smith, the commissioner of the NTRA, Carl Pascarella, the president and CEO of Visa USA. And with all due respect to Nick Zito and Mary Lou Whitney and Birdstone, I know that you and Visa now feel some of the disappointment that this overflow crowd felt that you didn't get to give the $5 million away again. Well, first of all, you can't help but be a little disappointed. But uh, I think that Smarty Jones ran three very, very good races championship races birdstone was a little bit better today and i've got to say it just shows how elusive the visa championship trophy is for the triple crown and if anybody's going to beat them i'm so happy it was nicky zito coming out of new york his first belmont i've known him for years and the icon of racing mary lou whitney phenomenal for them to win the Belmont and we're just very very happy for them and next year is another year for the Visa Triple Crown we're ready to go all right Carl Barry Schwartz is the chairman and CEO of Naira and he'll will he will introduce New York Governor George Pataki well, we've seen a spectacular day of racing here today once again it's been proven that the Belmont Stakes is the toughest leg of the Triple Crown for any horse to win but we saw a terrific race here today and a terrific horse won it. Two terrific people own this horse. Two very dear friends of mine. I could not be happier for them. And now to present the trophy for the 136th running of the Belmont Stakes, the governor of the great state of New York, the Honorable George Pataki. Thank you, Barry. And let me first congratulate this crowd, over 115,000, who brought incredible excitement to this race. And while we're... Uh, and while we're all disappointed we didn't see a triple crown, let me say something about Mary Lou Whitney. Her horse won this race, and the first words out of her was, we feel horrible, because they didn't want to disappoint the crowd. But I can tell you, if Smarty Jones wasn't to win, having Mary Lou and John Hendricks win this race with a horse that trained in Saratoga and is going back to Saratoga, is the best alternative. So Mary Lou, to you and to Edgar and the entire team, congratulations on a great race. Thank you, Governor. Uh, John and I really didn't expect to win this race. We were hoping we might come in second because we love Smarty Jones. I think he's been one of the greatest things that's happened to racing in all the many, many years that I've been in it. And he's a great racehorse, and he'll come back. And we're just thrilled to win this race, but we feel awful that the crowd came here to see Smarty Jones, and it's sort of a happy and sad note for us. So you truly do have ambivalent feelings about what just happened. Yes, I think everyone would. Everyone loves Smarty Jones, but maybe they'll start loving Birdstone. We lost Edgar Prado because he had to go ride in the next race. Nick Zito, New York trainer, had been the runner-up five times previously in the Belmont. Birdstone went off at 36 to 1. Bobby Frankel had said before the race, realistically, we're all running for second. What did you think? Well, probably the same thing because obviously we've all become fans of Smarty Jones. He's been great for the game, but uh, Whitney's breed a lot of great horses over the years. Birdstone was considered almost a two-year-old champion. He won the champagne right here at Belmont Park. We just kept persevering, and uh, that's all you have to do. You have to just keep working hard, and something might happen. You have to play the game, and uh, what could I say? Your assessment of the race tactically, you may have heard Stuart Elliott say earlier, it was the mile and a half that got him. That's probably it. Most triple crown threats, it is the mile and a half. It's the last little bit, Bob, for whatever reason. Well, these poor horses, what they go through to get to the triple crown. We had skipped the Preakness. Maybe that was that length, you know, whatever it was. I don't know which foot goes which way, as they say, but you know what? It worked our way today, and 
like they say, this is a great lady, a great gentleman, and got my wife and family. And I love New York, as everybody knows, but this is it. Nick, congratulations. This is Whitney, congratulations. Thanks to all of you. My husband, John Hendrickson, is the one who bred this horse. And he's the one who takes care of all my horses. He's my, he takes care of the stable, the racing, and everything, Kentucky and everyone. So he really, he, we really owe him a big hand. All right, John, congratulations to you as well. And Tom Hammond, it remains one of the most elusive achievements in all of sports, more than a quarter century now, and counting without a Triple Crown winner. Indeed, Bob, and uh, the gracious people throughout the Triple Crown tale have been all those around Smarty Jones, Bill Foster holding him as he gets a bath after his efforts today. Let's go to Kenny Rice with the Chapmans. Thank you, Tom. They call their farm Someday Farm, and every day has been someday for the last couple of months for racing fans and for Smarty Jones fans. Now, Mr. Chapman is a little tired right now, but Pat Chapman's willing to talk to us. And Mrs. Chapman, you've had a few minutes to let this sink in. You've heard the compliments given to you by the winners of this race. What are you feeling right now? Well, I'm feeling disappointed for the fans of America, but I'm, I'm feeling that we were beaten today by a better horse. And I wish I could be down there to say personally to Mary Lou and John and Nick Zito, congratulations from all of the Chapman family. Uh, they ran a wonderful race. Uh, I'm disappointed that we don't have a triple crown winner this time, but we've still got a heck of a horse. And being second in the Belmont ain't all bad. And we're on our way. <laughs> And we're, we're on our way back to Philadelphia. Oh, they cut me off, but we're back on our way back to Philadelphia. The NBC audience heard you, and the fans know there that you will be going back to Philadelphia, and we'll see Smarty Jones continue to run throughout the summer? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, I'm Le hearing all these... Leading up to the Pennsylvania Derby was your plan, and then maybe the Breeders' Cup. Right. That's what our plan plan is. We would really like him to run back in Philadelphia one more time. Again, thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Chapman, for your time. Thank you. Tom, uh, well-wishers continue to come by to congratulate the Chapmans on this terrific run they've had. Back to you. All right, and there is Smarty being cooled out back in the stable area after his second-place finish in the Belmont Stakes. Coming up tonight at 8, 7 Central on NBC, it's the season finale of The Restaurant, followed by Law & Order and a special edition of Dateline, focusing on President Ronald Reagan's extraordinary life and career. So once again, our hopes of a Triple Crown winner are dashed, and the longest time between Triple Crown champions will extend now to 27 years. Birdstone was the winner today and take nothing from him, and yet the thoughts naturally drift back to Smarty Jones and his improbable story. Even if he failed to write the ultimate happy ending to that story today, in the chase for the crown, he gave us five weeks of pure joy proving that even in this deeply divided country in troubling times, a genuine hero can be a unifying force. Smarty meant so much to so many people that even in defeat, we salute him and all those around him for making these last few weeks so special. Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. Tom Hammond for all of us here at NBC saying so long from Belmont Park.